So, uh, welcome back. This will be to introduce a uh, fall lecture series Monday evening. Uh, we will pick things up more rapidly now. This will be the first of four in a row. So, next Monday is Rashid Musabi. Um, following Monday is um, Maurice Blanks, who's a grad from this program and co founder of Luda. Uh, and finally, he took one month from Brown University. Tonight, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome back to UIC Alex Lanner. Uh, who's been doing some great missionary work for us, spreading the UIC gospel in underprivileged architectural centers <laughs> such as Zurich, Switzerland. <laughs> uh, Alex received his professional degree from the TU in Berlin, his both professional master's from UCLA, and his PhD from the Etehad in Zurich, where he's currently an assistant professor affiliated with the ETH Future Cities uh, Laboratory in Singapore. In between the bread, both literally and figuratively, uh, of the ETH sandwich that formed his doctoral work and his current teaching. There was his three-year experience as assistant professor here at UIC, where he developed the dean of his project. Um, uh, Alex is the author of Grand Road and Rules, which was a version of his doctoral research at the ETH, uh, and most recently of Western, uh, the Western Town, the Theory of Accumulation, which was initially formed from work in his last research studio here at UIC and developed with our alumni, Jared Malkin and Jane Kelly, and the first example of the Trojan course of UIC content in ETH wrapper. Um, along with uh, Sabas Siris, Siriasidis? Kyriakidis. Okay. Uh, with whom he shares an architectural office, Alex was responsible for this year's German National Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, entitled Bungalow Germania which has received high praise in the press, uh, in many unexpected quarters, and for surprising reasons. And I'm sure we'll hear about some of those tonight. But uh, truly, it was one of the highlights of the economic, you know, along with the other U.S. Uh, but Alex's uh, German play was quite great. Um, while at UIC, Alex founded the Department of Urban Speculation, and through a series of studios and seminars, they produced one of the early uh, successful versions of recombining the formal and political that had been and remains an ambition of the school. Although if you asked him, I'm sure Alex would say uh, um, that he doesn't believe in teaching um, somehow. Uh, but he happens nonetheless to be a great teacher, uh, and probably because of that, he's motivated by the discipline and not necessarily the metrics of learning outcomes, uh, which is the new bureaucracy of teaching. Uh, I'm glad Alex is back now because it wouldn't have been possible to give any, uh, Alex any compliments earlier when he was here the first time. Because the secret is if you want Alex to do something and to do what he's doing, uh, and consistent with why you brought him, you have to trick him, uh, basically, by telling him you're not really sure what he's doing is right. Uh, I don't know, masking tape in the streets and upholstery, I'm not sure about that. Um, you know, maybe you've gone a little too far, but of course, uh, because of that, Alex will be really excited to do more of it, and then you'll be secretly happy that that's what he's got. Um, there are some people, lots of people we know, who can't take criticism. Alex can't take compliments. Um, he said, hey, that, that, that pavilion, that was really funny. He goes, it will say, no, I mean, it was seriously, very precisely built. It's very serious. You were wrong. Uh, and if you say, hey, that, that pavilion, that was, uh, that was really serious, crafted, technical, it's no, no, you didn't get it. It was funny. <laughs> uh, with Alex, uh, there's no way to win. Um, but I think there's also something, maybe uh, a deeper lesson about his work in that, which is somehow, uh, and I think of others uh, in the school, that some, is able to combine a kind of extreme rigor on the one hand uh, and precision, along with a kind of lightness or almost disposability. What uh, Alex and I might agree on, though, is that the Alex that the ETH thought they were sending us back in 2008 was not the Alex that they got back in 2012. And I think they kind of blame us for that. Um, they haven't issued a lawsuit against us yet for proving the Alex, but I think it's coming. Uh, my own theory about that is that, uh, that he and Paul Pryzner went through a kind of mind-body transfer machine. Uh, so they got Paul and Alex's body, and he kept Alex <coughs> incarnated in Paul's body. Uh, so we ended up with the low-text norms guy, and they got the high-tech forms guy. So uh, <laughs> you have an out, all right? Yeah. Uh, please join me in welcoming back to UIC, our topical son, 
and UIC's missionary in Europe, Alex Lanner. <laughs> So I think there's no reason why we shouldn't do the same. 
Um, architecturally, it is quite amazing to see uh, how this young nation was using modernism to break with its colonial, colonial past and start new in the 1960s and 70s. Architecture was quite was clearly part of the nation's cultural politics and thereby developed its own uh, specific specificities, as you can see here in the pink, blue, and yellow building, which actually is a shopping mall. And the funny thing is, I just saw it recently. Now it's all brown. Yeah. So it's not about the color, but the color is also kind of important uh, to express the kind of uh, mood Singapore is in. Now it's in the brown, and the pink. So there was, uh, so I think if there was a project, if there ever was a project Japan, yeah, uh, there definitely also has been a project Singapore, and uh, you, you might know the two projects actually had a lot of uh, things in common. A lot of things that, that didn't get built in Singapore in, in Japan were got finally or first built in Singapore. So that, there is a very interesting history about that in, in Singapore. So um, what we did, we called the whole project Singapore Tropicana. It was, a, it was named after uh, a nightclub in the 80s, and looked for historical artifacts in the city. And, uh, and here exactly is the problem about uh, uh, Singapore. If, if Chicago has like a too big uh, history of, uh, of modern architecture, then maybe Singapore has almost no history. So, and they don't seem to have any interest in preserving the buildings of that time, although they are really amazing. So you could say there is there's, there's almost no building in Singapore older than 20 years. All these amazing structures you see here were either already gone, totally derelict, or about to go. So our approach was to take these buildings and dramatize their history by montaging them into even bigger monsters, which are eating their, themselves, and also all traces of their history. Um, what we what we like uh, especially about the original buildings was that they that they were never really although they were built in modern in, in modernism they were never really following some functional truth of modernism. On the contrary, what comes across as functional features such as stairs you see there or rainwater pipes ends up being very figural and eccentric. And this is something. Where, where, like, which you see all, like, always in these kind of uh, regional modernisms, but also in Singapore, you see at a, at a, at a very extreme level. Um, so here's, here's your former student. Yeah, he's still alive. Max. Yeah, he, he wears a beard now. So this, this is like the kind of trophy we are we are taking with us from Singapore back home to Switzerland. Uh, so this, this this model is following us everywhere now. And we still haven't figured out what this actually is, but somehow uh, not even not, not only Singapore but also Zurich is, is kind of enjoying this little 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 city in, in, in one building. Um, so in the in search of uh, the city as the critical project of architecture, I think that's important how we see the relationship between architecture and the city, that one is always the critical project of the other. We also went to Jakarta. And I think like Anybody who wants to escape the Singapore goes to Jakarta to cool down a little bit, yeah, and to, to have a little bit of a messy messy cityscape in order to have, to be a little bit out of control. But in that sense, like uh, Jakarta is also very a very specific uh, the city, and especially those kampongs we look at, um, they 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 could hardly be any bigger difference between Singapore and these areas, these urban villages left out by the colonial past of, of the Dutch. Um, and this kind of difference always leads to some kind of strange romanticism yeah? uh, of what to understand urbanity. So many people go there and, and try to find the real city, yeah? like people and how people should live together yeah? in this kind of informal way. We, we ourselves didn't want to try to be um, uh, romantic, but instead very precise in this Maybe sometimes an unprecise looking, looking, uh, looking world in Jakarta. So it started as a kind of morphological study. With, uh, together with students, we, we started to draw a larger chunk of such urban condition in plan. Just like Rossi did it, like, just like uh, uh, um, Michael Alder did it in Switzerland. So we, we really tried to draw everything. Uh, from the larger structures to the smallest ancillary architectural features. There's everything except one thing. Everything except in what is called in modern architectural terms, 
uh, a cadastral map that clearly and unmistakably stipulates private property. Like this, like, like this one, you all saw these kind of things in America and the Western societies are big in that. Um, so, uh, and although Indonesia is at a very interesting moment in time where the modern concept of land ownership takes over the traditional communal right to land, there is not yet anything such as a comprehensive or collective overview of private land ownership. So, as an experiment to clash and montage traditional procedures and with the modern ubiquitous ones, we had to draw such cadaster for that area. What looks like a very simple plan actually was the most tedious effort ever. Yeah? We tried to talk, we had to talk to every single resident. And you can imagine that asking two neighbors this same question, um, what, where does your property start or end, yeah, produces in that context a wide range of very divergent responses. So, but we kind of managed to draw that map, uh, yet with a lot of implicit uncertainties. Um, and the last step in this experiment, there comes the tape again. Yeah, I'm sorry, like, like, we're not sponsored by 3M, but I just like white duct tape. Yeah? So, the last step of the experiment was to then again materialize, to kind of one to one montage these dramatically precise lines back into the area, previously totally indifferent to such precise demarcation. For that we used this tape, and, uh, and the result was really stunning. Neighbors, previously peacefully living next to one another, <laughs> now saw this line, yeah, and immediately got into some weird negotiation, if not to say some actual fights, yeah, about moving this line, this white abstract line, to the left and to the right. And I, I really, uh, we all felt a little sorry for producing these kind of uh, <laughs> conflicts, yeah? Because we, did, we thought we didn't do anything wrong, yeah? But somehow it was still a very kind of brutal act. And there was a lot of like, and we, of course, the first thing we had to do is to take this line away again. So it's, it was just research, yeah? So. But what is quite amazing is, to see how an instrument that creates, in a very positive sense, in our, in, our, in our Western societies, some kind of hygienic condition between different individual interests produces such turbulences and instantaneous conflicts in an area such as the Indonesian temple. And the reason is not ideological, yeah? but it becomes controversial as soon as there's doubt about this kind of seemingly factual truth. And what is also clear is um, what kind of powerful uh, is not to say brutal thing a plot line can be. So we we kind of actually like the brutality of the plot line. So we so uh, uh, the former Lumi here, Brad, uh, Matt van der Klok, will continue his research on researching the plot line globally. And a few days ago, I actually was uh, have been to Toronto, yeah, to go there, it's, uh, um, and visited this building where you can see how razor sharp, yeah a plot line can be. It can cut through a whole building. And actually, I didn't know that, that, that Toronto has such great architecture. <laughs> so you should also go there. Anyhow, uh, I already confess that I get more and more interested in history. Yeah? But history not as a discipline, but as a project, which makes history even more complicated. My approach to history has always been the one of an amateur, which I finally allowed myself to consider as a quality to do certain kinds of projects. Yeah? So as soon as you claim you are a real historian, you are really limited, I think. Yeah? So I never say I'm a historian, but I, and, uh, I couldn't, yeah? of course. I tried to be an architect who tries to maybe uh, explore the idea of some kind of historical project. Whereas I can't say in general, but I have now some examples of how maybe that could work, or at least it could work. Uh, as such, I like the idea or challenge of a kind of continuous presence, or at least as something borrowed from English grammar, which is called present perfect. I mean, I'm not, a, not an English native speaker, so uh, the present perfect was always the hardest thing for me to learn. Yeah? It's kind of something that starts in the past and has some kind of, some kind of condition effect in the present. So one intriguing pres uh, present perfect technique is, of course, uh, spoiling, meaning to, to loot or to steal stories and montaging them into a new present. 
But I think the other way, the other direction is equally interesting. Taking a new story and in reinserting it into an existing past. So for example, Woody Allen Sally, you probably might know, that means uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about Woody Allen from a European point of view, but you might you might know that it, uh, it's a very good it's a very good example of this kind of inverted spoil. But the best points I think uh, are those that combine these two directions um, and allow for a kind of simultaneous dual legibility into both historical directions. One project which we didn't invent ourselves, but what was important to us to document was the project of Western Town within the Hollywood movie, which does exactly that. It reinserts new stories into a very ephemeral moment of American history and urbanization, which otherwise we would probably have completely forgotten about by now. If the Western wasn't there, I think this kind of typology of the town we wouldn't know about anymore. On the one hand, this project, we are in, in this project we are interested in the, in the phenomenal qualities of the Western town and its typology, but we are equally interested in how that project digests historical truth into some contemporary, contemporary cultural reality. There's a nice quote uh, of some unknown newspaper guy of that time that explains our ambition in the past. It says, this is the West, sir, where the legend becomes fact, print the legend. The project started almost like it started a long time ago. It started 10 years ago. And um, it was 10 years ago when I first uh, met Bob in Los Angeles. And I was really intrigued by his quest for nothing. Yeah? <laughs> and your, your, your nothing matters uh, is still some kind of talismanic text for us. And ever since we tried to find uh, nothing just like you all. Yeah? So I knew nothing of Bob before I knew Bob before I met Paul in Los Angeles. And so we, we tried ever since to, to, to find nothing and then we really went into the desert. So we went to Idaho as well to look for this town. It is the town of La Hook of 1967 or 1865 respectively. And of course, what we did find down there was exactly that. We did not find anything. It was basically nothing. Yeah? We only found the backdrop of that um, of that town. Um, nevertheless, um, it, it would have been nice if, if, for example, we found this dentist's <coughs> house all made out of raw planks with suddenly that kind of extraordinary high resolution uh, uh, refinement in just one corner. We also went to, so this is the town in plan, so we drew all these towns in plan as if they actually exist. We also went to the town of Lago at Mono Lake in California. So here, is, here you see the picturesque little town in 1868 and its reality today um, at, at Mono Lake. So here you see Clint Eastwood's horse, yeah? the stranger's horse, and down there you see our car. And of course, again, it was a big research success. Yeah? <laughs> we just found nothing. Yeah? Except for some, a few plants, half charred in dirt. But no town like this, with everything a proper town needed a barber shop, a hotel, a saloon, and a church. Back then, at a very interesting moment, the whole town was turning red. And the reason is the unique historical occasion where the stranger himself became an urban designer. Yeah, the town people were asking him whether he could save them from incoming gangsters. And at first he didn't want to, but then he decided otherwise and agreed under one condition that the whole town needed to be painted red. Nobody really understood why, but they all did and got killed in the end anyway. <laughs> it's quite sad to see how little power urban design had these days. <laughs> a very beautiful antithesis to this research is Pioneer Town, also in California. This town was inaugurated in the year 1946, exactly when they shot a Western movie in that area. So the first structures ever erected here 
with the two walls of Main Street, it's over there, you see here. So this is actually the birth of that whole town. Um, and, and over there, and immediately after the shooting was done, people backed the fake fronts yeah, of these kind of stage sets and started their town. It's quite amazing. So the structure, the, so the, so the, so, so very literally, the town was born through a door in the wall in the desert. Uh, this is one of the kind of, you don't have these kind of town inaugurations in Europe, so it was very important for us to draw these towns, in, in, uh, also to draw the history of that. Um, so, so here you can see the map of the whole west uh, with all the 22 towns we, we uh, went to visit. Among there are famous places such as Presbyterian Church, the very first pure pleasure town long before Las Vegas, only, really only based on individual desire and goal. Or the epic story of what has, come, what, what has to come first, infrastructure or buildings, as seen here once upon a time in Sweetwater, where a smart businessman built the station and the town before the giant cantilever of the railroad came from the east. Here you see the whole optimism that was put into such endeavor, and of course also in plan. Or the roadhouse, yeah, a kind of mall, very early mall, or if you want a whole interior city in itself, where once you might know the stranger played his harmonica. This whole project um, no, kind of marks our change of perspective, for perspective, literally a kind of 90 degree change from infrastructure to the structure of the town itself. People refer to these town types as some kind of street type uh, uh, kind of town, which is in fact quite misleading. The western town has no street. It only has buildings. And the town is only as big as the canyon formed by one house after the other aligning next to one another uh, in this long line only with private porches, but no public sidewalks or whatsoever. But plenty of extremely interesting structures in, term of, in terms of material, organization, and type. For example, there's the stable, here's the stable, there's the hideout, the lean-to, uh, the reverse ruin, and lots of other never really fulfilled ambitions. However, what, um, what was important is um, the, the cohesion of town is not provided by these elements or primary elements as, uh, as other Rossi suggested with the example of Rome. The cohesion here is formed by a much smaller scale than that. By, by, the, by, the, by the building single features that kind of explode into the exterior. There's no encapsulation as in on the left or stacking but an intricate exteriorized play of single details Losing, uh, usually belonging to the interior of the house. One of the best examples yeah, is the outhouse. I think the outhouse is one of the most overlooked types of buildings ever. So, but it's always in the right distance to the main structure and clearly contributes to the domestication of the exterior of the town. Here you can see how the, how the outhouse works. Yeah. They, they even form a kind of a collective of themselves in the back of the tower. Um, so, we got so much into the potential of the outcomes yeah, that, uh, that we brought over an original from El Paso, Texas to the Rotterdam Biennale this year, to the Netherlands. They wanted to have the project, but they didn't want to have the outcomes in the feast hall. But of course, and quite naturally, an outhouse is not supposed to be in the Kunst hall, and yeah? it should be outside. Yeah? So we desperately looked for a place in Rotterdam <laughs> where to put this outhouse. Yeah? Here you see Jared Mecken, one of our researchers, yeah? with Thomas Dahn, to look for, right, for the right position of the outhouse in order to domesticate Rotterdam. <laughs> So I think we, we found some pretty nice places. It was really, really a kind of tedious effort 
to drive around with the outhouse for, 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 for a couple of days and one of them. Um, so, but we found some places where it really made a kind of complementary contribution to the city. And, and, and very interesting, uh, our outhouse also goes quite well with classical modernism. As you can see here, standing there right next to the Sonnefeld house, right next to the NAI. Um, but no wonder, it is some kind of autonomous lean to abstract itself from a discussion of front and back and ended up on the sides of a building. One of the most, uh, one of the most interesting types that also does that in the Western is the stable, especially in its relationship between ground and mass. Here is one good example from Rio Bravo, which with a kind of pasture in its, in its gap. So if you look at the two contemporary and prevalent types of ground and mass, we on the one hand have the suburban version um, uh, of a building inside a block, and on the other hand we have the urban derivative block in the middle. Now the stable does this. The building mass seems to no longer be fully encapsulated or surrounded by its plot. It kind of stands out. Simultaneously, it's both very urban and suburban at the same time. This third type of is, is kind of very important and very interesting to us, as it questions the very fundamental rela relationship between land, ground, and mass. So overall, the amazing thing is the town has only a very ephemeral relationship to its ground. And the good thing is, you only have to build one side of the town, the other one can be simply mirror, and the infrastructure in between is nothing else than an automatic byproduct of the whole procedure. It is very unlike uh, the modern way of building, you can imagine, yeah, where the street always comes first and then comes the building. So I think this was also one of our arguments with this, with, this, with this type of project, that we try to work against the doctrine of modern infrastructure, because we also know uh, how it all ended up. There's European examples and North American examples, uh, like massive amounts of that. So um, with this project, we also would like to tackle another fundamental and admittedly quite old uh, discussion about the difference between texture and object. For us, the Western town offers a third <coughs> kind of typology, which is both a result of collective form, yet with a distinctive urban figure. We, we kind of call it, or we nickname it, a uh, textured figure that has attributes of both the uffizi, yeah, on the left, which has only backs, and the unity, which is only fronts. So this kind of eternal discussion that kind of uh, arose up and down and still goes on as a project. So I think our western town, uh, with a little detour across the Ponte Vecchio, Ve Ve clearly offers a different type or some kind of solution maybe of that problem. So it also helps uh, these kind of categorizations to help us understand these kind of structures better, which we which we really started to like. This is a house by Charles Moore. <coughs> or his, um, his Crespi College campus. Uh, these are all structures with, which are both space positive and mass positive. And I think <coughs> the kind of typological design uh, uh, issue, I think these, these projects are very interesting uh, also to help um, in getting over or across these kind of typologies. Jared Mackin is currently looking at, at such figures in his PhD by looking at the modern and mysterious type of the town center where these figures reach some kind of critical scale within the critical context of an almost always arbitrarily set center of town. And finally, and then I'm ending with this project, um, um, programmatically, the West offers the kind of 10th idealized user of, the, of a kind of 20th century uh, architectural discourse on the city. You know, we have all these guys, we have the noble savage, like Corbusier, the noble savage, the worker, the family guy by Lenny Town, the planeur by, uh, who is that again, uh, Benjamin, the nomad, Constant, uh, 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 the, who's that, the participant, Benham, the burger, Los, and of course we have the bachelor and the consumer by Kuna. And now, now we also have the stranger. 
whose biggest quality is his enormous indifference towards the town. He's the only one who can ride out of town the same way he's riding into town. He's also the only one, the only one among these ten who does not produce a kind of deterministic condition between program and form, which I think is very, very liberating and a kind of necessary thing to do today. So at the end, we found more than nothing. Yeah, that's a little bit of a bummer in the West. But this project provided us with a distinct technique of how to have a proper, yet never stable dialogue between the present and the past through this everlasting loop between historical facts, a specific narrative, and contemporary truth. So now I'm at the project I actually want to talk about. The task, uh, so, so this, this speculative project of the Western Town was kind of a blueprint for our project of the curation of the German Pavilion at this year's Venice Biennale. You might know that, that all the pavilions got the task uh, by Kuhlhaas to, to look at architecture's recent past through the lens of national history. As, so as I said, we are neither historians nor are we curators. We needed to find an architectural moment where these two stories, the one of architecture and the one of national history, were able to meet. We found this moment in an architectural montage of two buildings. Two buildings highly charged with political and cultural meaning. One, I mean, who, who of you has been to Venice? Yeah, so some of you might know this giant uh, German pavilion on the right. Um, it is the German pavilion itself in the Giardini that was extensively remodeled uh, by the Nazi regime in 1938. And this is, of course, the biggest problem of this building ever since. It basically is a building that only consists of entrance, yeah, and was supposed to only consist of entrance. But uh, there has been a lot of, and a, and a lot of discussion ever since after the war to tear down this building because it's, of course, or it's seemingly no longer representing uh, a, a democracy and a new kind of federal republic of Germany. Um, but, but I think for us it was a, just a kind of perfect uh, playmate for the other building we have chosen. Um, the other building um, is quite different but equally charged with meaning and ambition. It is the official house, as you see on the left, of the German Chancellor built in 1964 in Bonn. Uh, Bonn is, was uh, for a long time uh, Germany's temporary post-war capital. It was, uh, this building was the place where the Chancellor had to live and represent. So to speak, it was Germany's uh, modern and maybe modern version of your White House, yeah? or the Downing Street or the Embassy Palace. It was supposed to be the nation's, or it was re always referred to as the nation's living room. Yeah? So Germany tried to represent itself no longer through columns, yeah? but through a very domestic space where the Chancellor invited over friends and, and uh, yeah. So this was very, this is a very different kind of representation of how Germany decided to, to speak of itself in terms of architecture. But I think, so, so, so this, is, this, is, this is the original uh, bungalow. We refer to it as bungalow. This is a kind of incorrect term, I guess. Yeah? I mean, uh, bungalow in, 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 in American English is something else, but this is what Germans think of bungalows. <laughs> it's kind of something. No, it is. It is. It is. Uh, it is uh, everything a proper bungalow needs to have. It has a nice patio. It has a nice chimney. Everything is very transparent. Yeah. Every building had to be transparent in order to be democratic. Yeah? There's a kind of very, very like a big short circuit between when something is transparent, you can see what happens. So it has nothing to hide. So the people who live in there. It must be very nice people. Yeah, and it has a giant canopy, but it's not on a podium, it doesn't have any kind of giant house, and so forth. So, but nothing, nothing really makes uh, the similarity. So there's a lot of difference, but there's also a lot of uh, similarities. And I think nothing makes it more clear what the similarities are when you ask uh, what their clients 
were saying about this building, about the, these buildings. The first one above is the, is the second chancellor of the new Federal Republic of Germany, Ludwig Ehr, saying, saying something very beautiful about this building. He says, um, you will find out more about me if you look at this house than if you watch me deliver a political speech. Yeah. And then comes the other one. It's Germany's last dictator, saying in 1937, when people are experiencing great times internally, they also find external images of these times. Their word is more persuasive than any spoken word, for it is a word made of stone. So first and foremost, uh, these two buildings were nothing else than means of political communication. So if you assume buildings can speak, this project had to go like this. The experiment was, of course, to let these two buildings speak with one another. And uh, we, as the guests, are just the audiences and witnesses of this conversation. So this was basically the whole project we had in mind. So therefore, the bungalow, like the kind of fake bungalow, but it's also a pavilion, had to travel from Bonn to Venice to get almost unbearably close to the pavilion. So at first, uh, we really thought they would not get along with one another at all. Yeah. Uh, so and, and in fact, there were some quite unfair and nasty violations that those two buildings did to one another. So suddenly, the bungalow gets on a podium, something that our bungalow, at least, never really wanted to do. Or it gets viciously directed through the grand, through the, through the Kind of giant portico of the pavilion. On the other hand, if you look at the at the plan, at the longitudinal plan of the central space of the pavilion, it also gets brutally centered by the bungalow's patio. So here you see the plan of the whole experiment, where you can also see how sometimes harmoniously these kind of two buildings work together. Somehow like, the bungalow fits almost too well into the pavilion. Here in the section with the, with the, with the two low roof, here you can see the kitchen, the temple pool, the chimney, the patio, the canopy, the car, the office. So it almost fits quite nicely in there. So, for example, here you see the bungalow roof, uh, which respectfully stops just 30 centimeters before the pavilion wall comes. And of course, like if you see this picture, the first question was, or we, we estimated that the first question will be, if you have this nice German bungalow, where is the park? <coughs> yeah. Because a bungalow is nothing without a park. So this was a kind of a big problem for us. Because everything you see through these windows is nothing else than these kind of blank walls of the pavilion. So together with Bill Forsyth, the choreographer, Choreographer, we thought, okay, we cannot, we cannot bring the park actually in there, but we can bring the sound of the park to Venice. So the project went like this: we we invited ten old guys, ten Italian old guys, who are experts in bird calling. Yeah, it's a kind of a, a kind of not a transport in uh, in Italy. But at least Italy is very sophisticated in this kind of bird calling. So, and we actually have the world champion. Yeah, this is the world champion. He's the best bird caller there is. And this is our minister. Yeah, and she was really enjoying herself. Because <laughs> you, you could also have wishes. Yeah, yeah, you could also wish for a nightingale or something. But, the, the basic, but this was like some, some, somehow counter to our to our project. Yeah, because these guys, yeah, they were standing there all like all together in the pavilion, and they were supposed to only sing those birds that are extinct since, since 1964, yeah, which is very important. So, at least in terms of listening, we are actually in the year 1964. Yeah, and of course the material 
um, is something which what we actually became the most difficult question of this project. When we were like introducing this project to to the general public or also to our clients, we were always running around with this piece of brick in our hands. Yeah, you know, we said, okay, we're not going to put any timelines uh, in our pavilion, but we will only use that kind of brick. And whatever this brick will tell us, that's enough for us. The people didn't really believe us, and they kind of said, you have to put some timelines anyhow. <coughs> but in the end, we still like refuse that, and the brick is really the only thing. Like the material is the only thing which is talking in this pavilion. But the question is really, can a brick like this talk about all these kind of political gestures that happen in the two buildings? Somewhere in this, even Henry Kissinger, yeah? So the brick can tell these, can retell these stories. But I think it was also in the end not important for us to exactly retell these stories. But the important thing was the clash and the kind of correspondence between the two buildings. So, yeah, what does it tell us? That is the big question. Especially, the question gets evident when the material becomes totally dysfunctional in the beds, yet reaggregates into a quasi functional hole again, like this chimney inside the pavilion. At a, at a very silly moment, yeah, we fire up that chimney to almost contradict its dysfunctional yet very physical reality inside the pavilion. We had to stop the experiment also pretty soon, <coughs> clear, yeah, and there was, a, in the, on the back of the roof there was a guy sending with a bucket of water because all the substructure is out of wood. But at least we tried it and it is somehow functional. But it also, it, it somehow contradicted uh, the idea that all the materials, all the, all the stuff needs to lose its functional determinants. For example, there's also the glass in the bungalow that doesn't provide any views to the outside or thermal barrier anymore. On the contrary, the glass becomes an object in space itself and is such subject to different kinds of interpretations. And the glass is really interesting. Yeah? I, I already mentioned it, that there is this kind of uh, belief that if something is very transparent, it's very honest, and, uh, and that reflects on the people who live in there. But a great antithesis comes from the Hollywood uh, movie. Yeah? For example, that in Hollywood, always the biggest gangsters live in the most transparent houses. Yeah? Just remember Pierce Patchett, who lives in the one big uh, Californian icon of modernism, the Lovell House, or on the top, uh, George Castleman, who lives, uh, who lives in, the, in the house of Frank Sinatra in Palm Springs. So you could also then, like if you take that story on, you could also think about like what, what were these guys doing in this, in this hidden away bungalow in Bonn all the time, when there was, like behind these bushes, yeah, when there was no media on board. So this whole building is also interesting. It only existed in German, in the German uh, reality as a kind of media project. Nobody ever saw it. Only pictures of it. So it also spins through the story of, of uh, Colomina's uh, architecture's life in a different medium. But of course there were also like giant events there, yeah? So the Queen came to visit. And it's kind of, when the Queen came to visit in this building, it, kind of, it became also clear what kind of building this is, yeah? So the only stability yeah, in this picture is provided by our former chancellor. Because usually you always see the queen with giant columns and not in this kind of shaky tent-like structure of this bungalow. So I think when you, when you look at this, the, the very important thing to, to realize is here is that, um, that there's no real winner in this tale of these two buildings. But in best case, some kind of dual legibility allows for some kind of third space to emerge, to emerge between the two. The pavilion door, doors, this is a very interesting detail, are too tall for the bungalow roof. And every morning the pavilion opens, yeah, the pavilion doors cut into the too low roof of the bungalow. <coughs> or if you see here, the, the whole reorganization of the space 
with a lot of weird material layerings and a lot of blind hallways. Or here is the inaccessible kitchen. Yeah, you can't access it, but the water is dripping. That, that drove people nuts. People came to us and can't you shut down the water? It's a waste of water. Yeah? This is the, this was also important to us to trigger the kind of or to make clear that this building actually lives because this pavilion, of course, had no connection to water infrastructure. But only with the dripping faucet it was able to, to live as a building. Here are the much too the, the way too low apps in the back of the building. Yeah, it's, it's something that, which is really like intimidatingly low. Yeah, it's a kind of post-war mediocrity of Germany, if you will. Or here, a cut in half sofa, because of course the sofa is also quite stubborn, and it didn't want to move, so it got cut. It's funny that the material you see here is very like it has very big contrast. So the material is really the, the material of 1964, very contrary to to how it looks now in Bonn, because in Bonn there's some kind of even yellowish, yeah? because some wood gets darker, other wood gets lighter. So we thought yellow is the color of, of our federal republic, but in fact it had much more contrast. And you we always keep saying if you want to see how this building looks in 50 years, you have to go and see the original building. The most uh, um, critical thing was, of course, the car. Yeah? It, was, uh, it was an extreme fun to bring it to Venice, yeah? to have it drive by San Marco, and then, of course, to have it drive by on the Giardini, again, then drive by America, Russia. Yeah? It's not past Russia, really. So and then, and then it's standing here in front of our giant entrance, and that was kind of too much for many people. Yeah, they thought it's like it's too big of a gesture, but for us it was also something to something liberating because uh, first of all you only do this kind of thing once in a life, and then you can at least tell your kids that you that you brought Mercedes uh, the, the, the car of Henry Ford to to Venice where they never ever drove a car. So this was, this was important for us, but also this is the only historical artifact we actually use in, in Venice, and it serves both buildings, both the pavilion and the bungalow. So it provides some kind of knot for the whole project. And it's kind of very like natural scene of natural representation we also see nowadays uh, everywhere in the world. So, Cowboys, bungalows, pavilions, there's also a lot of rules in my life. Yeah? So I really like rules. Because and they kind of belong for me as a kind of method of urban design, which is distinct to architecture. So uh, I wrote this book of 115 rules, that is some, somehow a collection of the rules that kind of build the, the city of the last 100 years. And um, so I, I don't worry, I'm not going to go into all of them. Um, um, what is interesting, because the, the two projects I showed you were very much into like, or oh, were touching some scenographic uh, um, uh, issues. I would like to introduce you to one visual regime I like very much. And I, this is somehow my favorite rule already for, I think, two years. So let's, uh, I, I, I want to ask you a question about these two pictures. Yeah? And um, yeah. the one who can answer this question gets a book. <laughs> can take something home. But it's a very difficult question because uh, it's really not easy. <laughs> <laughs> So we have two very different locations. We have uh, 
there is a place in Switzerland, very green, yeah? and we have Mount Holland Drive in California. So I zoom in a little bit. So this is Switzerland, and this is California. So who of you can tell me what the difference is between the two pictures? It's amazing. 
That's how easy it is. Another one in London, so it's not only happening in, in the United States, is in uh, the view corridors of St. Paul's, which you can see here. Every monument has some view corridors, which make sure that uh, the buildings aren't like standing, aren't surrounded by giant high rises, but so the visual skyline is not polluted. So here you have the whole rule set of St. Paul's. So there are these points. In Disney World, it would be called Kodak points, where from where you can see St. Paul undisturbed by high rises. So that produces these kind of visual effects in the city. Very scenographic, very detailed, very precise from just one specific uh, location. But there are a lot of great developers and investors who are really creative who found out that they can quite well build behind St. Paul's. So this is... <laughs> the developers become quite sophisticated and quite uh, uh, creative when it comes to these kind of urban rules. All right, that's it. Thank you very much.
especially in an urban discourse, when it's not directly about um, form and mass, yeah, or things like density. But of course, all that like kind of uh, triggers these other questions. I have a question about <clears throat> it's interesting, you know, how you were in LA and then you came to Chicago and you don't have this in the right sequence. And then you went to Singapore and now you're back to Zurich. Every time you go to a different city, you seem to tap into the kind of nuances of that particular place. So remembering some of the work you did here. Mm -hmm. like, kind of almost a satire on the particular place. And then in Singapore, you know, the, the shopping mall, you know, commenting on the kind of cultural nuances. And I know when you were in LA, I'm thinking the Western town work emerged from your time there. So now that you're back in Zurich, a city that, you know, is your kind of home, how, how, is, how do you continue to play on those nuances, or do you have to keep traveling? Sandra's probably saying, no, no, no. <laughs> but do you have to keep traveling to kind of continue that way of looking? It becomes much more difficult, you know, when it's, um, and I, 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 like, when it's your home, you don't have this kind of outside perspective, so you can't do these kind of uh, straightforward observations, no matter how true they are or not, yeah? I think that's, 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 that's really true. So yeah, I, I like the kind of outside perspective. And, uh, and somehow, I, you know, the best thing would be to maintain that without having to travel anymore. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I have to make sure. I, but, that's, but that's why that's why I'm also like so much into the figure of the stranger. Yeah, he doesn't. He never really fully adjusts. Yeah, he does something there, but he never like. I don't don't think I am a stranger, and I do I want to be a stranger, but I'm intrigued a little bit by this kind of. Uh, always keeping a little bit of a distance. You said that actually Yeah, yeah. Which, but if I can give my follow-up question to that, which is most of your work is celebrating popular culture and also a lot of humor in it, and yet one way I've discovered that you're a real German in the pavilion <laughs> in the sense that it's really a very critical project. And I mean, I think Yeah, and it's kind of where you can just laugh or 
Fanny Stupid. When you were talking about the topic, maybe, maybe I, this is critical in a way, not kind of nationalist criticism, maybe, but uh, I mean, the way critical of the elements show through the mechanism of elements, I mean, the, the, in that way, it really does seem to be, as you say, the building without a book. I mean, the element shows all books, and yours is no books, but sort of staging the same enactment of system. So, you know, Modern window versus punch, you know, Nazi window, yeah. or this door versus that door. I mean, the fireplace. I mean, it's actually a catalog of the same set of elements, but you're performing them. You're not simply having kind of an archive of a book about so, I don't I mean, so in a way, I don't know if it's systematically far relative to the context of the show, but it, in a certain way, it performs the show better than the show. Yeah, I mean, it was the kind of simple task was, it was, like, it was already done about representation, like the national representation of the building. But the, the, the way we did it, we didn't want to do, we want to use representations, yeah? like texts or images. We, in that sense, we wanted to own, it's not architecture yet, yeah? because it's not, it doesn't move as much ever, yeah? it's not a building yet. But it tried to be as architectural as possible, like to be very material and not using any kind of uh, other form of media as a kind of representation of what we actually wanted to say. So it should, it should have been, like, we really wanted to create this kind of presence, yeah, there. Without, uh, we didn't want to do a show where you can just buy a book and read it at home, yeah, so you should have to go there in order to buy the book, and not the other way around. So that was it. But I think, I mean, no, it also seems like something in the air that, Maybe other plays didn't do it as successfully, but somehow time to performance, not performance art, you know, the installation project, whether you're reenacting it or rebuilding it or having bird whistlers or Russian tour guides yeah. or fake offices uh, in the US. I mean, yeah. Somehow the idea of the, the theatricality as a performance against the foil of the shop of just art guides. But let's ask the other curator here. Uh, what was your impression of that? Of your pavilion? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but how did you handle it? Like, you also did some kind of spatial installation. Yeah, yeah, no, I was uh, yeah, I was I got, No, I thought that, I mean, like, um, uh, the other is taking on the kind of the, the national pavilion as a material. I thought it was, uh, I mean, we were talking about that in the opening. I mean, that, that what? The sense of humor that could become universal or could be only get like certain kind of nationalities. Yes. Yeah. Like I mean, I could not share certain kind of jokes, you know, some pavilions. Uh, I could share, I mean, the humor that was embedded in yours through its position. Maybe because I mean, the capability of certain to meet the position or the effort of yeah. them in a certain way. You know? So I think what was interesting was basically that there were some pavilions that were engaging in the problem of. Um, literality as a device towards a certain kind of narrative instead of trying to, as you were saying, like, to do media representation, which was already like a, like a mediated kind of material to talk about certain changes. My question to you would be like, how much do you think that that's going to be eligible? Are you going to be a human instead of making as a material to work with? I mean, like, how much German people will be in the same way that they're supposed to be reading? What was yeah. the potential effect? Is clear, is experienced the ambience, but the most kind of marketing one, how much do you think was effective? No, I guess like, like uh, that was a level when you then actually had to take the book and read it, yeah? yeah. And like, that, that added information that made it richer, maybe. Mm -hmm. But of course, the, the immediate experience was very like little. Then you got into a building, and suddenly you might have known this building from before, the pavilion. Child pavilion, and then suddenly you're, you're pressed down. And this is like a very like, immediate. Yeah, but that's why yeah. I thought that the car was, the car was more important than what you were paying this. Yeah. Yeah. That's not only our view. For me, it was the codifier for really making almost mandatory to understand the innovation in yes. a way. Yes. That's it. So it's like almost like the index of everything else. Yes. That's if you don't have a car, maybe you don't have a lot of time. 
No, but what was the key to it? Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that was that was important. Yeah. But that, that's that's what I mean. That, I mean, I, I wouldn't know the importance of the car. We we're not going to make a fun comment. Like, no, no, but it's absolutely yeah. important to understand the rest. Yes.